For years, the quest to promote locally made products has been an on and off affair. This has made it difficult for homegrown producers to either find market or solutions to their challenges. Subsequent governments since independence have made attempts but not full exploits. This has often left the Made in Kenya label without the necessary support and noise to take over the market. Going forward, Business Now has made a deliberate plan to highlight and celebrate the entrepreneurial spirit of Kenya. We shall, from today, in every episode, showcase Kenyan manufacturers doing the most, surmounting challenges to remain steadfast in their quest to promote locally made products. We are counting on you, our viewer, to help us in this rallying call for Made in Kenya. Good afternoon, I'm Yvonne Okwara Matole and this is Business Now, the show that celebrates Kenya's entrepreneurial spirit. But first, here are the highlights. On the show today, we highlight what it takes to make it locally as a manufacturer. What challenges exist for local manufacturers and how do they navigate them? And we premiere our new segment, Made in Kenya, where we feature local manufacturers espousing Kenya's entrepreneurial spirit. And today, as we premiere that series, we also have a few of them here with me in studio. We'll be talking about that. Made in Kenya, a uh, quick question for you. Would you buy products from a company that is made in Kenya? Would you buy Made in Kenya? Let me know. The hashtag is business now at Citizen TV Kenya and at Yvonne Okwara. I'll tell you who my guests are in a moment. But first, let's take a quick look now at stories that are making headlines this afternoon, beginning with the government that has installed a 275 kilovolt amp power supply and connectivity project. The government says it will supply electricity to all the residents in the area within two weeks. Energy CS Charles Keter revealed the government has set aside 1.2 billion shillings for Garissa County, which will be used to set up and supply hybrid power connectivity from both solar and diesel to boreholes and all schools. Elsewhere, some retailers in the country have continued with their strategic expansion of taking up space occupied by rival supermarket chains. Naivas opened its 74th branch in the lakeside city of Kisumu over the weekend. The Naivas chief commercial officer, Willy Kimani, says they're partnering with their suppliers to ensure customers get value for money. In Kericho, little-known Kipchimat supermarket opened a new branch in town. The retailer takes over space that was formerly occupied by Tuskies and Nakamat supermarkets. Kipchimat has branches in Bomet, Kapsabet, Liten and Kapsoit. And finally, Tourism and Wildlife Cabinet Secretary Najib Balala has challenged the government to invest more resources to the Kenya Wildlife Service to make it more efficient in its conservation activity. Balala says the agency had a backlog of more than 14 billion shillings compensation claims yet to be honored to victims of human wildlife conflict. He spoke during the launch of the KWS strategic plan for 2021 to 2024. All right, so would you buy Made in Kenya? Or would you patronize a company that's providing goods or services that are solely made in the country? That's what we're talking about today. Here are my guests on the show this afternoon, starting off with Peter Scott, who's the CEO, founder of Burn Manufacturing Company and also the founder of Burn Design. They're the makers of Jiko Okoa and also a recipient of the Made in Kenya logo from Keproba. Also, another recipient of that Made in Kenya logo is Grace Mbugwa. She's the CEO of Jayla Collections, manufacturer of leather products like belts and bags. You'll be seeing her and more of her products. Victor Otieno, not a stranger to this show from Viva Consult, here to talk to us about MSMEs and how they are working to do that. And finally, we've got Mushai Kuniha, who is the chair, the chair, Mushai is the chair of the Kenya Association of Manufacturers.
All right, so it is time for the five today. Now, the Buy Kenya, Build Kenya initiative was developed in 2017 by the Ministry of Industrialization, Trade and Enterprise Development following a presidential directive. Now, it's all about boosting the local manufacturing sector um, by authenticating goods and services that originate from the country. But it came at a time when Kenyan made products were associated with poor quality. The companies had low skill levels. And so the Kenya Export Promotion and Branding Agency developed the Made in Kenya initiative. Now it is a process that results in a Made in Kenya mark or a Made in Kenya seal, and it's given to companies whose products or services are, of course, solely uh, made in the country, or at least in a great part. Now, of course, this is to give consumers the assurance of quality and authentication of the true Kenyan identity. But not just anyone can put this mark on their products. There is a criteria provided. Now, I know typically here, this segment is called the five, but allow me to break the rules today because I want to give you that criteria. And there are six in number let's of course start off with the very first one which is all about location now this is the first one here now with respect to location the companies must be located in Kenya now as for employment the Kenyan employees in that company seeking this logo must be the majority that is at least 50%. Also, the company seeking this certification uh, must be compliant with statutory requirements like tax compliance, registration certificates. Now, the companies should not be insolvent and should not have been debarred from public procurement. The companies must also be certified. They must bear the mark of the Kenya Bureau of Standards or any other recognized certifications that are specific to their industry. Now, here's another one on product design which must be wholly or partially mined or produced in Kenya and finally the sixth criteria is that the country of origin of each significant component of the goods that are produced must be Kenyan as outlined in the EAC customs union rules of origin now what are the benefits of the mark you may ask with this seal your company can benefit from the preferential procurement by government agencies in line with section 155 of the public procurement and asset disposal act that states that 40% of the public procurement budget by ministries and state departments be reserved for locally produced goods and services. The companies also get, as a result of this uh, mark, access to financing, promotional services and training from the brand agency. So far, 139 companies have successfully adopted the Made in Kenya logo. Two of them are here with me on the show today. That's the five made in Kenya. And the hashtag is business now this is our made in Kenya series we're kicking it off today don't forget we're focusing on another business and we'll be showing you that story in a moment or at least a little later on on the show but first let's get into our discussion on this series I'll be showing you again um, who the other guests are but I'd like to begin with Mushai Kunia who's the chair of the Kenya Association of Manufacturers thank you so much Mushai for making time for us on business now today let me start by asking asking you um, why this even matters why buy Kenya build Kenya um, why um, insist on having local manufacturing of what benefit is it to the manufacturers to consumers and to the country's economy okay thank you very much Yvonne and thanks so much to uh, your program for highlighting this issue which is a big issue uh, Cam has been living on and uh, trying to highlight over the years so manufacturing is critical because of the jobs that you create here and the wealth that you live here. Any country in the world wants to um, grow wealth and prosperity because that's what's going to help our people um, develop, move, move forward. If we are working here and making things, we are adding value to something here and trading it with it amongst ourselves, it immediately helps us as a country 
to grow our economy. Because again, it's like passing on money to your brother, to your neighbor, rather than sending it across the oceans to other people. And of course, it's creating jobs for people who are here because they're able to work. And beyond the jobs is also creating investment because there are factories, there are um, uh, probably financiers, there are investors in those businesses that are going to create wealth out of what they're going to be doing um, uh, related to the manufacturing sector. More critically, I think, and especially for Africa at the moment, is about um, how we add value to our resources. Because everywhere in the world you have resources. We have agricultural produce, we have timber, we have... Uh, you know, rocks in our ground, minerals, and so on. It's whether you send them out with value added to them or you just send them out raw. So manufacturing allows you to add value to the same things that you had and that will gain more uh, revenue and income um, for your local market. Thanks, everyone. Um, and can we highlight some of the challenges uh, that local manufacturers face? I mean, you know, we keep hearing about this, but it might be good to hear from you about, you know, Definitely. consistent uh, supply of yes. things like electricity at an affordable cost, among, you know, many other issues that would then make that value addition you speak of uh, much easier. Much easier, yeah. I think, uh, Yvonne, I don't know how long you have and how, how much you want the other speakers to to participate, this could go on forever if we start talking wow. about our issue. Uh -huh. But let's start. I think fundamentally the big picture is, is competitiveness. So Kenya is, we've set ourselves up as a free market economy. And in a free market economy, what you're saying is people will exchange goods based on supply and demand. And it is people asking um, if, if a customer wants something and somebody else can supply it to them, they are open to do it, which also means we are open to external markets. We are open to imports from other countries and so on. So then the key thing for anybody in manufacturing or supplying goods is your competitiveness. Am I supplying, uh, am I meeting the demand, because demand is one part of it, and at a good price, because then that becomes the key issue. So one of the big challenges we have as big picture, and we are trying to push this to parliament, to government, is to understand we are in a global economy. We must be competitive. So when you start putting in taxes, regulations, the price of power, the labor conditions and so on, you need to look globally with our neighbors nearby, with um, people far afield. Are we making these competitive? Are they going to allow us to continue to meet that demand at a price that is competitive mm. to others? Are the same restrictions being uh, put on other manufacturers who are in other countries, for instance. So, for instance, right now, in the new finance bill, we get new taxes on packaging. Uh, there's a new tax on packaging, which is going to affect things like oil, and this is cooking oil and so on. And this is at a time when cooking oil prices are rising. So you put an excise tax on the packaging. If I bring the product package from another country, I don't pay the excise tax. So you're making my local manufacturer less competitive. Mm. Uh, than a global, uh, any other global player. So that starts becoming a challenge. And we must start thinking about how do we develop our competitiveness. That is what is going to make us succeed as manufacturers in Kenya. And thanks for that, Mushai. Uh, Victor, here with me in studio, making us globally competitive. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, is that even harder for SMEs? Of course. Um, I think there's something that um, we must note in terms of government strategy, uh, in terms of supporting manufacturers. I think there's uh, an irony in the sense that a government on one hand is saying uh, we want to support local, but on the other hand is pursuing strategies that uh, works against um, local manufacturers. And I'll give you an example uh, of AGOA. Mm -hmm. where, you know, government, uh, Kenyan government has made a pact with the U.S. to get second-hand clothes. Of course, uh, second-hand uh, second second goods. Mm -hmm. Of course, by the virtue that, you know, they are second-hand, it means that local, um, the cost of local manufacturers cannot compete. That's number one. Number two is the <coughs> U.K. trade agreement, where, yeah. again, uh, a lot of U.K. manufacturers receive a lot, a lot of subsidies. Again, it works against uh, local manufacturers. And for, for me, that, that conundrum is, is, is still in my mind. I'm wondering, um, are we serious in terms of do we really want to support uh, local manufacturers? And is there, is there a market for made in Kenya? Uh, um, this is my experience, and it's purely anecdotal. So you're on Instagram, and 
people are doing all sorts of things. Um, you know, body butters, people are, you know, it's really cottage industry, people doing it in their backyards, in their kitchens, people doing all, I mean, producing just about anything you can imagine. And, and that should, is, is that the case? That should say something. And you know, on, on the much smaller scale, you know, even if you were to take a look at the micro aspect of the MSME sector, um, you know, is there a demand for made in Kenya? Because maybe about 10, 15 years ago, one of the issues was, um, you know, quality of the product, um, low level uh, skilled workers, uh, you know, and producers. Has that changed over time? I think uh, there's a, we have a big problem in terms of uh, the way we perceive local products. Yeah. I, uh, probably it could be a social orientation or something. Okay. We always feel that um, uh, products from outside are better than uh, than um, uh, local products, and of course there are um, uh, there are two sides to that to that conversation in the sense that uh, local products are not consistent, and consistency is part of quality. But I think uh, uh, local manufacturers over time have been able to uh, do that. But I think from a Kenyan perspective, we still have that uh, perception that mm. uh, something from outside is always better than um, uh, local uh, local. Uh, but in some instances, it's cheaper. The of products course. are cheaper. Of course, it's cheaper, but... Um, Naturally. <coughs> I mean, you know, economies of scale, they're able to produce in larger volumes than, than we are. Agreed, and, yeah. but, agreed, but there is a level of patriotism that you need uh, for you to be able to sustain local demand. Yeah. If you go to Nigeria, for example, they would buy their own fabric. Uh, but if you come to Kenya, then uh, I would rather have uh, a foreign uh, product coming. Mm -hmm. let's, let's speak to them here, actually, because we've been talking about them. But <laughs> let's talk to them <laughs> now because they're here with us. Um, let me begin uh, with you, Grace. Uh, Grace Mbugwa is the CEO of Jailer Collections. You make leather products, right? Like, yes. like bags and belts. Um, and you are a recipient of the Made in Kenya logo, right? From the Kenya Export uh, Promotion and uh, Branding Agency. Uh, so first of all, speak to us about your journey and, and why you're choosing to have all your products, um, all your raw materials are sourced locally. And yes, your staff. Yeah. So talk to us about your business. Uh, okay, JLo Collections is um, a young company. We are about six years now. And our agenda is to provide that quality product he's talking about. Mm -hmm. That you, if you go to our shop, you'll find that leather quality product, leather bag, leather accessories, and they are well done. <coughs> um, we, I'm excited to say that being a Kenyan, I would love to see the skills I'm also utilizing are for another Kenyan who is also providing for us the accessories and mm -hmm. the items that we require. So we make um, the leather from our tanneries. We buy the leather from all local tanneries. Um, you request what you want and you make your order and you get the quality. Okay. That I can affirm to you. Uh, I still think that there's a lot of learning, especially for certain fa um, types of leather, like for clothing, it's still not yet mm -hmm. um, being done. So there's still room for expansion. So sourcing locally has uh, worked very well for us. Some of the accessories are actually not still produced locally. Certain zips that I want mm -hmm. are not from Kenya. Uh, for the leather products. Yeah. So as much as I want to source everything locally, there are certain items that I may not fully get. Now, that is what I would say on that side. However, for me, I'm, I'm happy to see when I source a certain accessory. I'll give you an example. We do brass. We use a lot of brass for our finishing for the bags. <clears throat> I will get it from uh, groups in Rogai or Kibera. They actually make very fine, good quality finishes. So I don't need to buy from anybody else. So as much as the countries go on to, uh, to provide us with certain items, our Kenyan companies are able to, to provide with us items that we still need. Okay, uh, let me ask about the cost. Mm -hmm. um, you know, leather is, when you buy a leather product, you know it's going to cost, uh, you know, different from something that's not leather or plastic, mm. if you like. Is it, is it cheaper for you to, would it be cheaper for you to source some of your products or a good number of them from abroad? Um, I, I haven't attempted to do that okay. because I have been able to get them Because you've been able locally. to find just as much yeah. as you want. To Anything that I don't have locally, I'm able to source from those who are able to bring them here. So that again is the part I was mm. saying. It may bring some level of expenses, mm -hmm. but let me say that since we started using the logo, I have seen some certain interest. Kenyans have also started okay. to appreciate what is made in Kenya. It has the challenges. He said that we still need to do a lot of publicity, yeah. education and uh -huh. value and, and the changing the perception that our products are not necessarily good. Yeah. But if you go out, out of the country, you'll find made in Kenya products. 
uh -huh. but they are out there because export market appreci uh, appreciates uh -huh our products okay. so locally it's Sadly. work to be done okay yeah and, and and that's an interesting thing about how uh, you know the made in kenya logo perhaps is more beneficial you know in the export market than it is in, in in the local market and we'll come back and talk a little bit more about the benefits that you have seen um, with that made in kenya logo you know in as far as uh, pushing your business but some interesting insights on, on what you're doing and how you're able to source you know quite a bit of this material that is good quality and high quality locally um peter you're with burn manufacturing now when people say burn manufacturing what's that but when they say jiko koa then you know we sort of have an idea. Talk to us about um, the journey and and why why you chose um, you know these products and, and and yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm a huge proponent of local manufacturing, and we've really built our business around local manufacturing. So we started in 2013, um, and we our focus was to design the world's most fuel efficient uh, maca stove and wood stove, and then make those locally here in Kenya. And so we currently we know we employ 400 people. We've made and sold over 1.1 million. Jikos, those have all been made here in Riru. All of the R&D is here, all the manufacturing uh, is here. So that uh, it's interesting, when we first launched, we really promoted that the stove was designed in the USA, and we were kind of silent on where the stove was made, because there was this idea of like maybe a local product was gonna be low quality. Mm -hmm. But now when we do our market research, because people know Jikokoa, and they love Jikokoa, and they love the fact that it's manufactured locally, and we find that like 70, 80% of our customers want to buy it because, and so now we're actually promoting that it's made locally, whereas in the past, we kind of were, were silent on it. I think there's really a revolution happening uh, in Kenya right now in terms of manufacturing. We can beat the Chinese on price, performance, durability, all of those things. And um, yeah, it's, there's still this idea of like, oh, it's made in Kenya, it's probably not as good as somewhere else. But really we've built, the world's most successful clean cook stove company. And there's, there's nothing else like it in the world of what we're doing here. And the center of cook stove research and manufacturing is now in Kenya. Mm. Mm. What was um, the process like getting the Made in Kenya logo? Um, you know, we just listed the criteria at the start of the show, but you know, was that a hectic process? Was it tedious? Was it, you know, take us through um, that and why you sought that? Uh, yeah, it actually was actually not a very difficult process because we had already checked all of those boxes. Mm -hmm. If we hadn't, it might have been more difficult. Yeah. You know, it's interesting, there's like a, to get the certificate of origin, you need to show 35% yeah. value add. But, uh, you know, for us, we've not just done assembly, but full manufacturing. So we're not just taking parts made in China or Turkey or something and assembling. Mm -hmm. We're doing the full, like, raw materials in, finished goods out. So it was very easy for us to meet this 40% criteria certificate of origin um, yeah and it's you know it's interesting it's been a, it's been a very it's been a great positive for us and even when we sell stoves to say like uh, Somalia or uh, the Horn of Africa is that you know we've actually when we first started making a stove and selling it into Somalia we did change the packaging to make it look more Somali but people said no no that's probably a knockoff we want the Kenya original right. so the the our like some cool Somali packaging sells for less than our authentic oh, so? original packaging. Okay. So people really see this as like, oh, we know now globally, yeah. Burn Chico Koa makes the best stove in the world. We want the original, we want to be certain it's made in Kenya. And so the Made in Kenya, Brand Kenya logo is, is, is really key for that. Okay, yeah. all right, and, and we'll, we'll come back to that. I don't know if uh, Mushai is still uh, with us here. Um, Mushai, on a larger scale, perhaps uh, quite a few of those issues that we've talked about, uh, you know, taxes, but. I wonder what this means for the MSME uh, sector, you know, the really smaller businesses that are, you know, working out of their kitchens, working out of their backyards. What, what, what is manufacturing like for them? And, you know, are there any challenges that are specific to them than those who are perhaps in, um, in the larger sector? Yes, thanks. Um Yvonne, sorry, my, my internet dropped off temporarily. Um, but I think that the regulatory environment is a big challenge, um, both for large and small uh, players. And it's worse for the small player, because in a larger player, if you take some of the larger manufacturing, they actually have a department that deals with this, corporate affairs, regulatory, they have quality people, so they have enough people. But if you're a small operator, you find the, the entrepreneur, the 
uh, founder of the business is trying to do all of this work at the same time. And that can be quite challenging for them um, when they have too many rules to follow up. So like last week, we had a boot camp for um, the different entrepreneurs trying to tell them uh, and show them the way on how to deal with different regulators um, along the supply chain. What we advocate for, we do need regulation. So let's not say we don't need regulation at all. It ensures there's quality, it ensures there's consistency and some uh, level playing field, as well as protecting consumers so they know what they're getting. But how you implement those rules, how easy it is to follow the rules, is what is the challenge and it's usually also a problem when they keep changing them um, and making them um, not user friendly so for instance you'll be asked to go to cabs produce certain documents and keep going back and perhaps you have to take them manually um, some of these regulators are now going online which mm. makes it much easier for people to comply and perhaps also how we set those standards and the requirements we can make it much easier for the msmes and the SMEs to, to get um, qualified. KRA is another um, example where actually among the local regulators, we say they've moved the most. With things like ITAX and so on, you're able to deal with most of your taxation issues um, online. But it's not all of them, and there are still challenges that would, would um, affect any person. Where we have the biggest challenge, I think, is where the counties come in. Yeah. Because the counties have so many uh, regulations changing and less developed systems on how you're going to be able to address um, those regulators. In addition, now we are getting more and more new regulators, like in agriculture now, we've gotten some uh, new regulations on, on produce recently and asking you to pay uh, taxes. That again means if you are a small player, you have to go all the way, find where the upper office are, try and get all these forms and uh, fill in new regulations and so on. And that is a real burden for a lot of producers. Mm. Indeed, uh, Mushai, yeah, uh, somebody here agrees with you on Twitter. Uh, one of our viewers is called Brown Sankale, says, um, he says, I'm a manufacturer of electronic equipments. My quality, uh, my products are of high quality, but the number of costs of licenses from the county government, the Kenya Revenue Authority, government registration, I moved to the Philippines and my products are selling a lot. Why not here? So, you know, some anecdotal, um, you know, evidence of just what, what you were saying uh, there, uh, Mushai. So, Victor, you know, this is where we are. And, and like Mushai says, it's harder and it impacts you know, much, much higher on, on, on the smaller players in the sector. So now we have a Made in Kenya initiative making attempts to say, look, these are the, the companies, this is the criteria that we want, um, you know, go through this and, you know, then that helps. Is that enough? Um, I think uh, more, uh, I think it's a good initiative on one hand, but I think uh, there has to be a level of cascading of that made in Kenya to the people you're calling cottage manufacturers, mm -hmm. uh, the informal sector manufacturers. If if you can be able to have a similar um, uh, certification of sorts, it could give it could give uh, the it could give an indication of quality at that level. One of, one of the things that um, I think uh, um, Kenyans struggle with in terms of uh, quality or perception of quality is, for example, if I was to go to Karyoko Market, there is that perception that it's low quality. Mm. But if you can be able to get a similar certification for made either for Karyoko Market or the different products that are there, that could raise the perception of quality of local of local manufacturers. Mm. Um, and I think also there's an opportunity for Kenya um, in terms of manufacturing uh, manufacturing globally. If you notice um, uh, countries such as Vietnam, China, uh, ETC um, have been highly labor intensive markets yeah. in terms of manufacturing and uh, they are slowly moving towards uh, automation. Uh, there's an opportunity for uh, local manufacturers, uh, the informal sector manufacturers to move into that space uh, where you, we do high labor um, or labor intensive um, uh, you know manufacturing which can be able to absorb a lot of the youth mm. uh, uh, that are you know that are idle mm. because manufacturing you know is is labor intensive yes, yes. I, I believe I, I read some statistics a couple of years ago that you know manufacturing for what what would be one job in any other sector in manufacturing is anywhere seven to nine uh, you know persons so it would be able to uh, sort out uh, quite a few of these issues we're due for a break in a short moment uh, but grace let's have you weigh in on 
you know, where this goes next for you? Like, you know, is there automation? Is, is that what you're considering? Because a lot of, you know, where you're sourcing your products, um, you know, you've gotten the certification, mm -hmm. but have they gotten the certification, you know, at, at their level? And do you feel that, you know, maybe that is necessary in some way to just, you know, continue to ensure the consistency and quality of the raw materials and the components that you require? Uh, <clears throat> for us, one, one thing that I would say that I appreciate is the trainings that goes with this uh, mm. certification. Yeah. Uh, we are beneficially also of the training of product development at uh, the Keproba, and we are still on going through that training. And I think I would, exp uh, would encourage most in this sector to actually go for these trainings because the training gives you the ability to appreciate quality and its impact on your end, uh, end user product. of your product. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So if um, if you don't have that, you lose out on something. So for um, trainings, the government has, the Keproba team actually has been going all over the country and they come and spend time with you, giving feedback, helping you to understand also the export market and also how to make your product very competitive. I think that is one of the things they have raised. Mm. Secondly, I think trainings also for your own internal staffing is very critical. When you say automation, mm. For now, um, I'm, I'm, I'm tapping into the artisan skills, okay. and you know that there are so certain all things your products you can't are handmade. handmade. They are handmade from start to finish. The, the, the finishing, some there are at certain points we use machines okay. for finishing, but everything else is handmade. Uh -huh. So you see, that's a skill and gives opportunities for employment for the young people, and also the trainings that we do, especially for leather, because it's not just produced that way. And I think maybe on the area that he mentioned on career core market, I think for me would be to intensify on trainings, yeah. to upgrade on where they are, because creativity is so much in that in their products. But sometimes along the way, and the quick, you know, you want to quickly yeah. finish, and also because of turnaround and numbers and everything, and you lose out on quality. Mm. So for me, I think that the trainings in uh, investing on them would be critical. And also, again, when it comes to um, increasing the number who have the the what the, ma the the mark, I think trainings and also understanding what is it that you need. And because for us, we also got the the, the exposure of all these other agencies through one meeting yeah. by the government. Organized to meet the cabs, the KIPI, and, and the tax people, we all met there and to understand what is it that I require for me to get the certifications for each of those sections. Okay, um, before we take that break, if you were to, how many people do you employ at, at, at JLo Collections? How big is, is your organization? And if you were to take a look at the value chain, across the value chain, how many people do you think, I don't know if you're able to quantify or estimate mm. at least, you know, from the persons who give you the brass to mm. the, you know, the leather tanneries where, where you go to, what do you think is the impact, social impact of, of your company? Um, the social impact, I may not give you the numbers mm. of in terms of what, but I can tell you, okay, the staff, we are 28. And then you also have the other ones that you have from outside yeah. whom you engage for So besides the ones labor, who make the brass? The, there's else? the ones who make the brass. Bidding, we okay. do a lot of bidding. Yeah. So we, but we use um, Maasai women from Gong mm -hmm. and others from Isinya area. So you give them the materials they actually produce for you and you work with them on the design and the quality. They actually do what you require. Mm -hmm. So I have those the, the, those groups. Then I also say um, we buy uh, our leather, our fabric from the it's called thicker mills. Mm -hmm. Thicker mills makes and they can pattern for you. They can make the d the colors that you want yeah. and they give you the products that you require. So that is also somewhere else that you are also sourcing from. Okay. Yeah. So at the, at the end of it all, you are impacting different sectors. Mm. But I must say that our immediate impact is also for the communities. We engage when we have big orders because we do um, materials for like corporates when they have uh, they need items. Yeah. So we engage communities. We've trained some women. In their, they are in organized groups. They each come together in one congregated uh -huh. place. They come with their machines. We train them and they produce for us what, what we you require. Want. Okay, all right. Um, I haven't forgotten about you, Peter. I just need to take a break. So we <laughs> shall be back, talk a little bit more about that. Uh, and don't forget, uh, you know, just a quick teaser also, we kick off uh, today. Our very first Made in Kenya feature series will be speaking to um, various entrepreneurs. Today, it's all about uh, turning plastic waste into fencing poles. It's something you don't want to miss. That and much more with my guests after this break.
Yeah, because there will be days, remember, when the topic isn't made in Kenya. So if you do it in the middle, it'll, yeah, cool. And we are back. The hashtag is business now on Twitter. Thank you so much for your great feedback. I want to read one from um, Jacob Abere Matlala. You say, um, made in Kenya on production and market is achievable. What slows it down are patent time, foreign product mentality, which we've talked about here, lack of strong policies in helping infant industries like funding, research, and market search as China does for its people. And again, to maximize made in Kenya product use, we need to give subsidies, infrastructure developments, free electricity, I'm not sure about the free part, and cultivate self-product ambassadors like His Excellency, the President, with the cotton brand shirts from Rivertex and the Korogosho Ankaras that are sold in Canada. Keep your thoughts coming. Many of you saying, yes, you would, in fact, um, buy Kenya, build Kenya. That's uh, the rallying call since 2017, I believe, uh, when this was, you know, finally now, you know, made a little bit more formal than it has been in previous years. So, uh, Peter, with the uh, Jiko Koa, talk to us about, you know, the social impact of of what you do. So, in terms of, you know, how many, what th the workforce size is, but then also just, you know, across the value chain. Sure, of course, yeah. So as I mentioned, we've sold about 1.15 million of those stoves, and they've really made a transformative impact. A recent study by UC Berkeley showed that each household was saving about 12,000 shillings, that the total net benefit to society was 1,000 USD over three years from reduction in health costs, greenhouse gases, and fuel savings. So it really has been a transformational product on the planet. Like when you look at what's happening in Africa right now, there's 1.1 billion people. By 2050, it'll be 2 billion people. 1.6 billion of those people are still gonna be using wood and mm. charcoal. It's an economic catastrophe. It's an ecological catastrophe. It's like a health catastrophe. So Kenya has the ability to actually transform the whole continent by building super fuel efficient stoves here. So the government really needs to think about a long play, like how do we win? Now with the Africa Free Trade Agreement coming into effect, Kenya can absolutely win. So we're negotiating deals now to do you know, tens of millions of stoves across the continent that will help people you know, save lives and forests and all those things if we create the right enabling environment. So I think we've, Kenya Gov has done a good job, but certain things like they put VAT back on clean cooking, which mm. is crazy because it's absolutely not a pro-poor policy. You know, the people that are burning three stone fires are the ones that are suffering from pulmonary issues. So we designed the world's most fuel efficient household wood stove that reduces emissions by 80%. Now you're putting a VAT on that, it's absolutely not helping, helping the poor. So we're hoping, you know, the government's done, we've worked with the government closely and with CAM, but we're really hoping that they'll think about this long play. It's not just for helping people, but also it's the ability for economic transformation. Okay, so, I wanna, you know. because I'm still with you, um, to get your closing comments uh, on, you know, made in Kenya, do Kenyans care? Uh, your experience with, with, with your products, do Kenyans care about, buying products that they think are authentically made in Kenya and that have that identity. You know, we're just laughing during the break about, uh, you know, what you'd said earlier that, you know, you take the products to Somalia and you try to sort of localize them and they're like, no, yeah. uh, you know, 
get us the original product. We know what it looks like and this is not it and it's fine that it's made in Kenya and you know they right. were willing to buy that. Um, maybe locally versus uh, you know foreign because you know Grace mentioned the fact that you know made in Kenya is, is big business yeah. in terms of export. Is it as, as, as recognizable and more appreciated here as well? Once you've proven the quality, yeah. people love that it's Kenyan made. But I think that until people are really um, certain that, that the quality is there, and so that the after sale is there, and the warranty is there, and all of those things. So people know when you buy a product from China, eh, the warranty maybe is going to be like, you know, you're going to call Shenzhen and ask them to replace your product. So because Vern is local and will service the warranty, and there's warranty centers and all those things, that people love that. And like our staff love it. So, you know, we have people who have been with me for eight years who love the fact that we're doing this mission driven business and we're producing this very high quality product. You know, it's like, uh, it's like 99.97 right first time production coming out of our factory. The idea that you can't make quality in Kenya is insane and antiquated and from a different century. So, um, yeah, as long as you've got your delivering quality, people seem to love the Kenya symbol. Ah, absolutely. Yeah. Grace, your final thoughts? Uh, on my side, I, yes, I have seen that because we have a shop at the Hub Karen. And uh, one of the things that I've noticed people ask, are you sure these are made in Kenya? Because I want to buy if they're made from Kenya. So I've gotten that feedback. It's an African themed shop. We sell everything made in Kenya and made by uh, SMEs because we put together our efforts. And one thing that I ma I've, I've noticed and I can tell you is as much as we continue putting that face, and this is mentioned, the president wearing the shirt, yeah. that that also She's has been the biggest created. brand ambassador for yes. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. influencer social media if you like maybe <laughs> not intentionally but yeah yes it is because we sell shirts that are African uh, materials okay. and that really creates that the fact that there's a shirt even called by people that Uhuru shirts because it's long sleeved and the colors are is it like the one with the it? red and the, and the calabash the, the, no the one with the like <laughs> um, like Trees. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, I know. So the I think yeah, one I the uh, one thing that you realize is as we continue in having a lot of publicity around made in Kenya, the quality also being seen by one being won mm. by uh, our president gives you some message okay. that the quality is good. So I think that is one thing that we must be working on. But again, we also have to go in and appreciate that we keep complaining about employment of Kenyans. If we buy Kenya, we create opportunities because that translates to somebody's income. So I would encourage that Kenyans also uh, take in, buy our products. They are good. They are good quality because they are made here. And then secondly, if we are making like our leather products, uh, we when you have any like shining or cleaning or because leather will last for a long yeah. time. So you want some cleaning. We give you for free until you know until you want another bag. Okay. So that's one thing that I would encourage that the quality and the feedback, the support is here with you. So if you have a problem as you yeah. uh, with any of the items, your Kenyans yeah. are here. Their so products are produced The after-sales support that, yeah. you know, Peter was talking about as well, you know, with a warranty that you know that there is somebody locally that you can say, you know, hey, I bought mm -hmm. this product and, you know, either I need it, you know, upgraded or tweaked or, or you know, whatever it is, and that that is available locally as opposed to, you know, yeah. buying, buying imported. Okay, thanks for that, uh, Grace. Victor, your um, closing comments, we're, we're making some strides, no? We, yeah, we do, uh, we do. And um, I would want to just state uh, one, one point, is that in Kenya there are two kinds of entrepreneurs. There are the small business, micro small businesses who um, cannot formalize. Yeah. And um, um, the, it's food for thought for uh, government and other stakeholders to find incentives enough to enable small businesses to be able to formalize. Because there are, of course, benefits to uh, being formal in the sense that you can be able to um, access bigger markets in the EAC, ETC. But there are also entrepreneurs who want to formalize but lack information. And this is where we need to give government uh, credit in the sense that uh, if you look at uh, the Ministry of EAC and Regional Development, um, under the ease of doing business, have been able to develop a portal where uh, for those entrepreneurs who want to formalize, it's a, it's, a, it's a website where you can be able to get all the information that you want in terms of compliance. Uh, it's a so, uh, Kenya simple checklist yeah, of sorts. Right. Very simple. Yeah. Um, you can check it out, uh, Kenya uh, Regulatory uh, Business um, dot co dot k. Uh, you can be able to just get all the information that you need, um, you know, for you to be able to formalize your business. Okay, and some of them don't formalize. 
Do they all have to form a license? They don't have to. And they, because one of the criteria for made in Kenya is that, you know, you have to be uh, formal. And I agree. And that's yeah. why I say there are two kinds of entrepreneurs. There are those who formalization is too expensive. Mm. The cost benefit of yeah. formalization is too much. Right. But there are also those who it's just lack of information. Okay. And we have a portal where you can be able to just access and be able to formalize. Okay. All right. Uh, okay. And finding information on that. Mushai, if you're still with us, your final thoughts before we close? Yes, thanks. Um, I want to agree with all the, manuf uh, the manufacturers there, and I'm glad they all are, are members who are on the, the forum today. I think the one bit we didn't really talk about is exports, because we're we are talking about local manufacturing. But um, when we talked about the quality that is required, it is basically export quality, because you want to be able to compete in the world. And our encouragement to all the manufacturers is when you're making something, think about your global competitiveness. Is it something that it matches the quality of you know, global co quality standards? Or how close is it? Sometimes it doesn't need to be the best. It doesn't need to be at the top. But it's matching there. That's what you are, you are looking at. Um, and also the pricing. Can I match that pricing or that costing? Because that's where your your competition is going to come from. So you you want to see that you're you're matching global standards in that sense. And one of the things that uh, I think it was Grace who mentioned earlier is is like training and continuous development. Okay. Even in the large corporations, you find there's always a product development aspect. So. Even if you made belts, say, or like Grace makes bags now, you're constantly developing new ones, constantly training your people and trying to move forward. At CAM, we have um, different training um, platforms for both you know, large and small manufacturers and also MSMEs in things like Kaizen, quality, and so on, so that you can actually develop that. You need to, to grow on that uh, level if, if you're going to grow your business and make it consistent. Because again, uh, one area you've talked about is what is the quality and the consistency. You have to build a brand. People need to know that your product is worth it. And I think that was demonstrated in the band's uh, story. Um, on the export side also, remember Kenya's goal in uh, the big four was to get manufacturing to 15% of our GDP. The way we are going to grow it is if we have export markets. And so whoever is producing, we still need to think about what can we give to the world from the resources that we have here? What can we make that the world needs? And that's how we're going to grow our manufacturing to 15% and beyond. If you look at all the big manufacturing nations of the world, export is a big proportion of that. And you can't export everything. You can't manufacture everything. You just need to find those niches those things that you make which are best in the world are global standard and so we need to encourage our people they have the ideas and I, I love what we are hearing even in the conversations going on last week on made in kenya you see people are innovative people are doing different wonderful things which we can actually export so we want to build on those and um, put more wind in their sails so that we can grow into a big manufacturing nation mm. thanks Yvonne. Thank you for that, uh, Mushai Kaniha, who is the chair of the Kenya Association of Manufacturers. And, and that is important for us to, to get into. I want to run you by our Made in Kenya feature series because there's, there's quite a bit of feedback, but I will get to that as we close the show. But Kenya's capital, Nairobi, generates 2,400 tons of waste every day, 20% of which is plastic. For Joel Alogo, an entrepreneur, this trash is cash. And as Edward Chua reports, Joel collects huge tons of plastic waste daily, which he converts into durable fencing poles and building material. This billowing smoke could easily cheat your eyes into believing some heap of rubbish is being reduced into ashes. The black substance coming out with this heavy smoke is not lava from a volcanic eruption, but rather the final product that can last the next 30 years. Born and raised around the Dandora Dam side in this billowing smoke could easily cheat your eyes into believing some heap of rubbish is being reduced into ashes. The black substance coming out with this heavy smoke is not lava from a volcanic eruption, but rather the final product that can last the next 30 years.
Born and raised around the Dandora dump site in Nairobi, Joel knows all too well the effects of poor waste management and the risks of environmental degradation. These gave rise to his Vigingi Africa initiative, which makes fencing poles from plastic waste. I saw the need to solve a problem and make my environment better. We use two types of plastics, PP plastic used to manufacture polythene bags and HDP plastic used to manufacture uh, plastic containers. We source our raw materials from the youths in the slum areas. This is plastic waste dumped daily across Nairobi by the over 5 million residents, which makes 20% of the total solid waste generated daily in the capital. It is a daunting but rewarding process. We identified centers where they can be collecting, and in these centers we've placed our grinders to crush the plastics. This is uh, our raw material as it comes in, and at this unit we, are able, we weigh them, we bring it to the mixing section, we pass through the magnet to remove foreign metals that might be found. We take them into the extruder. The plastic is molted and then fixed into a mold. And then once the mold is full, it's, we cool it down in a water bath. The plastic content shrinks by around one millimeter round. That makes it easier to remove it from the mold. Turning plastic waste into poles and building material is a relatively new venture and entails intense processing. But the final product is durable, all weather, and gives good returns. They are insect free, they are more hygienic, and they also rust free. Long term we are cheaper than both wooden and concrete poles. We are able to achieve 150 posts a day. While there has been debate on whether Kenya's manufacturing sector is stable enough and going the right direction, Joel believes the government should do more to cushion local manufacturers from foreign imports that flood the market. We don't feel that they are doing enough because if we are producing locally and our cost of production is higher than someone who is getting the goods, same goods from China, it means there's a lot that needs to be done. One of the biggest challenges is the penetration of the product in the market. Our products can be used with nails and screws. Joel's venture is an indication that Kenya is full of potential and can make its own products and provide its own services. Edward Chueya, Business Now, Citizen TV. That is the debut of our Made in Kenya series. There will be a story like that every single week here on the program, highlighting lots of companies that are doing big things locally um, and living up to the standards and the quality. I want to take a look at some of the feedback we have on the show today. Um, Peter Kariuki says, I would be so proud to buy Made in Kenya. However, corruption that goes all the way to certification makes it so difficult to ascertain quality. Looking forward to hearing how this concern is being addressed. Well, not very specific about it, but, you know, hey. And Gishoi says, great move to highlight Kenyan entrepreneurs. That's the right way forward. Kudos. Thank you for that. And um, this is a tweet that I should actually read because I, you know, I resonate with this very well. It's from burn manufacturing. Uh, you say we boast of having one of the highest female employment rates at 60% at our manufacturing plant in Ruru, Kenya. So um, what we're talking about, you know, labor intensive and, and doing that particularly with female employment. So good <coughs> stuff with that one. And then um, uh, here's um, another one. These are uh, <coughs> quite a few tweets uh, from the Kenya Association of Manufacturers as well. I've already read uh, Brian's issue. Here's another one from Zangi Granola, I imagine. Uh, you say getting a startup premise that's convenient and affordable for startups in Kenya is an uphill task. Getting local manufacturers for standard packaging, there is none. You have to import from China. Is that so? That's packaging? That's interesting. Okay, yeah, where is the government in support of startups? Um, Morris says, yes, that's the best way to promote authentic Kenyan brands and products. 
and uh, Team Wangemi says, if, if um, more than 60% of the raw materials should come from Kenya, how is it that things like steel are expensive? This is just one of the many examples. And Ronald Ellie Wanda says, I always buy local. It is the best way to safeguard our local industrial development, except for wines. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. And by the way, there's there's some good, and, and this is not promotion because I'm not mentioning any brands, but there's some very good wineries in Meru, of all places, right next to the Meru National Park. Um, here's one last one. Let me read this one for you. At Nyakwar says, some of the universities like the Jomo Kenyatta University of Agriculture and Technology, my alma mater, are producing many products like mushrooms, honey. Can't they produce them on a large scale and sell them in supermarkets and for export abroad as well? So thank you. So some great feedback on that there. Um, this is definitely the show that celebrates uh, the MSME sector and best believe we'll have another segment like that for you again next week. And going by the list we have, we'll be doing this for weeks, months, even years to come for as long as God gives us breath. Thank you very much for watching the show today. That's where we leave it at. Made in Kenya, go buy you know something made in Kenya, even the wines, I'm sure they'll surprise you. Um, my name is Yvonne Okwara Matole. My great thanks to Peter Scott, Grace Mbugwa, Victor Otieno, and Mushai.